We are live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York City and streaming on Twitter. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, markets may be stabilizing, but risks abound. Joe Lubin, the co-creator of Ethereum, talks to us about the merge to proof of stake. And as the stable coin fallout keeps sentiment in check, we'll discuss the future of this asset class with Jeremy Allaire, CEO of Circle, which runs the second largest stable coin, US. Coin. And one of the biggest champions of crypto has gone silent. We haven't heard anything from Novogratz since the catastrophic meltdown of Terra. We'll take stock of the quarter of a trillion dollars lost in last week's destruction. All of that is ahead. And of course, last week was brutal. But a snapshot of the market today tells you things are stabilizing, at least right now. You can see all of the price action on CRYP Go on the Bloomberg terminal. But essentially, what you need to know is most of the digital tokens are higher today, including Bitcoin, which is still trading right around that $30,000 level. So not much changed, but still higher than the lows we saw last week. You also have some outperformance coming through, through from the likes of Litecoin and Monero, which are up about 7 and 4% today, respectively. Ether, though, one of the laggards here only up about one percentage point. We're trading around $2,056. And of course, it is that token in particular that catches our attention today, Matt. Yeah, we'll be talking about the um, move to proof of stake if uh, it happens. Um, Ether has come down already from um, relative highs in uh, 2021. We were almost $5,000. Now we're looking, as you pointed out, $2,000. And 22V says it could fall further. Their forecast is 420. Now, I'm not sure if they pulled that number arbitrarily out of the air um, because, of course, it's a weed joke. But uh, it does look like we're set for a lot more um, wealth destruction. We have had chaos. Now we have caution. Investors are picking up the pieces from last week's collapse. Winter is here. The, the tide is completely out. Rising volatility is just lifting all boats. This is a big sea change. Ponzi economics, right? That party is over. We've seen this movie happen before. I don't think it's a Lehman moment, uh, you know, obviously not the prettiest of episodes. Right now, if you're an investor, you've got 100 fires to put out. It doesn't seem like almost any asset class could be saved from the recent drawdowns, crypto included. You're seeing a reset time. I think we're close to the bottom here. Uh, if we're not there already, and we'll see that rebound. I do think the opportunity remains quite bright for crypto as a whole. I think once we get past this macro-induced volatile market, the crypto fundamentals will reassert themselves and will be trading on to new all-time highs. All right, so these wild swings come as the market faces a make-or-break moment for what may be the most important technology in crypto. Shanali Basic has the details. Shanali? There is a lot at stake, so to speak, Matt, <laughs> that it's billions being wagered on a long-awaited upgrade of Ethereum. And the upgrade has been years in the making and certain to ripple through the entire crypto ecosystem. Why is that? Because Ethereum has become the most popular basis for a growing array of assets and applications, including lending products, NFTs, as well as its native token, Ether. Developers who work on refining the Ethereum software are rolling out periodic upgrades, but none have been as major as the one expected later this year. The upgrade known as the merge will enable the blockchain to move from proof of work to proof of stake. This will reduce the need for mining and instead focus on so-called staking, where users lock up their Ethereum to help secure the network. Miners order transactions by solving complex calculations using millions of powerful servers, a system that's been criticized for its heavy use of electricity. But stakers, in contrast, will order transaction by putting up their own ether on a new system, which has been in testing since December 2020. The goal of the merge is to make the blockchain more secure against attacks, more sustainable and more scalable by increasing the number of transactions per second. And there's a question of whether this will also reduce gas fees, which are highly controversial transaction fees that can currently be inhibiting in some cases. A lot could go wrong before the merge is complete. Bugs, hacks, and some miners just don't believe the merge is actually coming because it's been delayed in the past. In April, one of the leading Ethereum developers said that the upgrade is most likely going to be after June, which is later than many observers have anticipated. But Kaylee, Matt, that, of course, is just around the corner. So a lot of news to come. Yep, just next month, but for now, we're all still waiting. Thank you so much to Bloomberg Shanali Basik. And joining us now to discuss the merge further is Joe Lubin, co-founder of Ethereum and founder of the global blockchain company Consensus. Joe, great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. I guess a three-pronged question for you. Is the merge really coming? When and what's taking so long? 
<laughs> um, the merge is really coming. Um, it's uh, it's been worked on for for years. Uh, that's true, but uh, it's a very complex system, and uh, uh, the pieces uh, are nearly uh, fully in place. Um, Ethereum 2 has been running for, for quite a while, as, uh, as you indicated. Uh, and it uh, it has 350,000 validators. And Ethereum 1 is merging with Ethereum 2 to create a unified Ethereum and, and transition from proof of work to proof of stake. And uh, the first major testnet um, is scheduled to merge uh, in early June. Uh, current uh, plan is June 8. Now, uh, there'll be a couple of other major test nets uh, that will merge uh, a few weeks after that. And uh, if all goes uh, according to plan, uh, we could uh, see uh, a Q3 merge uh, for me. Now, Joe, how do you feel about this? Because um, just yesterday, the New York City Mayor Eric Adams um, said to have to use blockchain from everything um, from basically deeds um, to birth certificates, um, other records. This is the way of the future and we're excited about it. This is something that we've been talking about in crypto for a decade now. And it makes sense when you have the immutability of a proof of work blockchain. I don't want to put th the deed to my house or my daughter's birth certificate on a proof of stake blockchain. It just doesn't have the security. Um, that is not correct. Uh, proof of stake is likely to be uh, far more secure, uh, far less attackable. Um, there, as I indicated, there are 350,000 validators uh, currently validating Ethereum 2. Um, there are attack vectors against uh, proof of work systems uh, that involve uh, essentially hiring um, mining power for short periods of time and uh, uh, executing an attack and then um, if you fail, then not that big a deal. Uh, if you fail, first of all, putting a, an attack together in a proof of stake system is enormously expensive because you'd have to. But very acquire, possible, right? Uh, all you need is 51 uh, percent. Uh, well, 51 percent of, of hundreds of billions of dollars is not easy to get to. But, and once you start trying to accumulate, um, uh, that would drive the price of Ether up to uh, essentially unobtainable levels. Only if you buy it, not if you steal it. Um, well, it would be very hard to steal that much ether, I believe. So uh, I uh, I have to disagree with you. I, I think it's pretty clear for people who understand Joe, what the about system, the centralization? The systems what about the centralization? Because it seems like there is <clears throat> a relatively small number of firms that are staking a whole bunch of different uh, coins. Is is it going to be as decentralized as a proof of work blockchain? Well, um, the openness, diversity, uh, and drive towards maximal decentralization of the Ethereum protocol uh, is underway. 350,000 validators uh, is a pretty big number, uh, much bigger than any other system. And the barrier to entry uh, for individuals or small organizations uh, to validate uh, the Ethereum network is very low now compared to proof of work systems. Um, it is the case that uh, that some exchanges uh, have sizable validator pools and uh, um, we built a technology that is just way more accessible and uh, it, it will lead to maximal decentralization. Okay, Joe, so let's talk about potentially problems that uh, moving to a proof of stake model could help solve. Obviously, a lot of NFTs use Ethereum, and we saw a few weeks back the incident in which Yuga Labs put up that virtual land sale, and there was so much demand, it essentially had ripple effects all across the Ethereum blockchain and sent fees soaring. Will a proof of stake system avoid that happening in the future? Um, a proof of stake system um, will. Um, lead to far greater um, scalability. Um, we, what we're seeing is the modularization of what has been a monolithic technology where, where all the functionality is in uh, the Ethereum protocol. We've teased apart the execution aspects uh, from the security aspects. The security aspects uh, are, are still intact and very strong because they come from maximal decentralization of the protocol. The execution aspects enables tens and hundreds of thousands of transactions per second uh, to happen, and, and that's already heavily underway on the Ethereum ecosystem, and that will drive much uh, lower transaction fees. 
the third major element of modularity um, is enabled by proof of stake, actually, um, and that's uh, providing to these layer two execution environments uh, what's called guaranteed data availability to enable them to scale in, in many more, more ways so that we get to um, hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of transactions per second as, as the system evolves. All right, so scaling up. Joe, let's also talk about DAOs, of course, decentralized autonomous organizations. You at Consensus uh, are just launching Village DAO, the first DAO that you are launching. What is the goal of that? Um, so our wallet, MetaMask, scaled rapidly um, from a million users to about 30 million monthly actives uh, within a year. Uh, and we had to figure out uh, how to um, support our customers as well as possible. We worked with uh, an organization called Live Person to add uh, AI automation, um, but uh, we still need uh, a lot more capability and, and support us in ecosystem issue. Um, we have lots of different applications in our ecosystem and they're all like Lego blocks. They're, they're interdependent and we need to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks uh, for our users. Um, so uh, essentially we're living in the age of silos. We're moving into the age of community and the best way for a community to be supported is for it to learn to support itself. And so uh, Village DAO is a platform uh, to scale customer care, enabling uh, members of a community uh, to be incentivized to become experts in uh, the, the products of, of different uh, um, companies in our ecosystem. And uh, we're incentivizing um, those same members to uh, assist uh, other users in the ecosystem and and, uh, and be compensated for their expertise and their effort in helping people. Joe, what's your take on <clears throat> you know what we saw last week with Terra and really more broadly on the quest to create a decentralized um, stable coin? It's been compared to the quest to create a perpetual motion machine. Um, is it possible? Is it necessary? It's absolutely possible. Um, it is unfortunate that there are projects in our ecosystem that uh, use decentralization uh, as a marketing term uh, rather than focusing on um, achieving rigorous uh, decentralization, progressing it as far as possible. And uh, uh, the mechanisms uh, in the, the Terra uh, ecosystem uh, were a little bit flimsy. Um, there are other um, partially algorithmic stable coins that uh, that use over collateralization. Um, there's a stable coin um, called the Hong Kong dollar um, that, that's been um, operating well uh, for a long time. Uh, it's more of a paper uh, stable coin. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, sound mechanisms are, are already uh, available and uh, and will continue to be uh, strengthened. Joe, great to get your take on all these things. Really appreciate your insight. There are very few people with the experience and knowledge um, that you bring to this uh, um, to, to this universe. So thanks so much, Joe Lubin, there of Consensus. Coming up, we're going to discuss whether stable coins are truly stable. Of course, there are many different kinds, but we're going to talk to the co-founder and CEO of Circle. Yes, we are. That's Jeremy Allaire. Plus, Novogratz goes silent. Why the billionaire investor has gone mute following the implosion of Terra last week. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto on the Bloomberg terminal, type CRYP Go. This is Bloomberg. Stable coins are something that all the regulators are looking at. Most stable coin use right now is really for speculative trading to go in and out of cryptocurrencies. And people wonder, is it going to be one day used for consumer payments? And many are thinking it's not ready yet. I wouldn't characterize it at this scale as a real threat to financial stability, but they're growing very rapidly and they present the same kind of risks that we have known for centuries in connection with bank runs. 
Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau commenting on stable coins following last week's Terra USD collapse. Joining us now um, is the founder of the company Circle. He's also the CEO and chairman, and they run the stable coin USD coin. Uh, Jeremy, great to have you on the program. I think there's Thanks, Matt. so much to talk about around stable coins, and not all of them are the same. Talk to us about USD and the backing that you have. Yeah, so USDC uh, was launched uh, nearly four years ago, and yeah, we, we took a, a path which was to work with regulators from day one. Uh, we wanted to have a dollar digital currency that was fully reserved, uh, that was uh, subject to banking uh, level uh, regulation and supervision. Uh, and we launched it under the same supervisory model and regulatory model that uh, products like PayPal and Venmo and Cash App and Apple Pay and other things operate under, which requires us by law to hold 100% in dollar assets so that your dollar balance is always uh, uh, you know, transactable as a dollar. And so that's uh, how we've approached things from the start. And, uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why USDC has become so popular and, and trusted. And, and the transparency that we've built around it has been really key as well, making sure that a top accounting firm is, is uh, you know, not just auditing mm. us as a company, uh, as, we, as we are in the process of becoming a publicly traded company, but also looking specifically at those reserves and attesting to them monthly. And so we've tried to operate things a little bit differently. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, taking that kind of regulatory first approach um, has built, uh, you know, a, a sustainable advantage for USDC. And you've been very good at working with regulators. I think you were the first uh, payments company to get a bit license in New York. You were the first to be approved in Great Britain. And um, you, you mentioned the audit there. This is uh, a concern that a lot of people have had with your larger rival, Tether, as well. Um, how should these audits be conducted? Do they need to be conducted for a stable coin to function properly? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, a, a, a large dollar stable coin issuer, if it's going to be used as a financial market infrastructure, if it's going to be used as an everyday payment instrument by corporations and households has to be held to very high standards. It has to be held to bank examination level standards. You need to have major public auditing firms. Uh, you need to ensure that the, the institutions that are sitting as the custodians behind that are of the highest quality in the world. So these are to us really, really critical. Uh, that's why we partner with great firms like Bank of New York Mellon and BlackRock and others. And it's also you know, one of the reasons why we've chosen to uh, file to become a publicly traded company. We want to be held to the standards of the SEC from a public accounting perspective, the amount of scrutiny that's involved in that. And all of those are about building confidence in this new infrastructure, which we expect uh, people and, and businesses all around the world to be able to build on top of. OK, so clearly we're talking about asset backed stable coins here, Jeremy. Have algorithmic stable coins now been entirely disproved as a concept? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the concept remains and, and there are actually many live projects in, in the ecosystem that are attempting this. Um, it is uh, the kind of holy trinity uh, uh, of, of, of kind of stable coins, uh, as, as Matt, you were saying uh, earlier with, with Joe Lubin, uh, it's sort of a there's this kind of quest uh, to, to find a way to do something like this. It's an extraordinarily difficult problem and no one has solved it. Over collateralized uh, stable coins that are decentralized have, have held the test of time. But that's more like a, a margin borrowing system as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, as opposed to, you know, a, a, a stable coin itself. Um, so, you know, our view um, and we were looking very closely at the Terra ecosystem and you know, Luna, Anchor, UST, et cetera. Our view for the last six months was that this was a house of cards. Mm -hmm. It was very high risk. And, um, you know, I, I think there were multiple scenarios where we could see it being triggered into a death spiral. And, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, we thought it might be 30 or 45 days out. It happened uh, more quickly because of a kind of, sh I think, shock to the crypto markets is just part of the broader risk off in the markets, uh, which was a triggering mechanism, uh, which which uh, obviously the, the, the unfolding has been widely reported on. But it was yeah. something that we um, had warned about and, and, and considered. But we've seen, obviously, since then, a real flight to quality. Uh, and, and that's, uh, I think, important 
uh, for uh, users of these digital currencies right. as they think about how to apply this. Well, let's think about how regulation should apply as well. As Matt said, you've worked closely with regulators already. We've heard regulators voicing concern around the collapse of Terra USD. What is the appropriate regulatory response? Where do you draw the line between regulation that's helpful and hurtful? It's a great question. You know, I think um, the, the, the Treasury Department, as you know, issued this presidential working group report on stable coins last fall. And Under Secretary Liang specifically, you know, in her comments said, you know, it's an urgent issue for Congress to address this because these are growing so fast. They have the potential to introduce meaningful risk uh, to the real economy. And, um, you know, here we are. Um, we're six months or eight months later, and uh, it's still an urgent issue. And in fact, the urgency has become even more urgent. So the, the ultimate question is, is what's the right thing to do here? What I would say is um, prior to this uh, Terra kind of fiasco, um, there was, I, I think there has been really good work going on um, in Congress. I think the Treasury Department has been working in good faith with mm. policymakers as well to define stablecoin issuer statutes in mm. the United States. Yeah. And we're seeing you know, very good progress towards that from both Democrats and Republicans and are optimistic that we'll see something right. emerge. Jeremy, great to get some time with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Jeremy Allaire there from Circle. Coming up, Novogratz lays low. Why billionaire crypto investor who runs Galaxy hasn't spoken out since the implosion of Terra and Luna last week. This is Bloomberg. with Matt Miller. Well, Mike Novogratz has gone silent following the implosion of Luna and Terra last week. The billionaire crypto investor and Luna supporter acknowledged so-called algorithmic stablecoins were set for a really big test after Terra USD lost its peg to the dollar, but hasn't sent so much as a tweet since. On Friday, his crypto firm Galaxy Digital said it was bracing for a $300 million hit this quarter, but that its treasury, quote, does not utilize algorithmic stablecoins. And of course, Matt, Mike Novogratz also has a giant Luna tattoo. Yeah on his bicep. I just want to know if it's getting removed. You know, I got uh, back in 1991, a pretty regrettable tattoo from a guy <laughs> named Flower in the back of a bus at a Grateful Dead show. And I want to get it covered up as well. So maybe me and Mike can go downtown and get new tattoos. And we'll take it live on the show. Yeah, that we'll do that live. <laughs> We'd love to we'll have do him it live. back. All right, well, make sure to join us again next week, Tuesday, 1 p.m. New York time. That's where you'll find us every single week. This is Bloomberg Crypto.